You're going to try it back now. Let's see whether it's got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, uh, the stuff around it, it? The white background doesn't but can you see any change? Is there a change in the value of the paper the, from the light? I was just thinking of it textually as uh, related to this by accident again. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, well, um, with my eye, with my bare eye, the, <clears throat> the background seems cream. Mm -hmm. Is there any pattern in it? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a dark line that comes from the upper right hand corner. Over there. Yeah, that comes yeah. down, hits the picture about the middle. And, and does it go into the painting? Uh huh. Well, that's what I'm thinking. It's right about where your hand is. This is what we're talking about. Is this an accident? Yes. Uh, and I see some of the texture up here that's very related to this. <clears throat> uh huh. I guess from where you are, it's more evident. Yeah. Uh, you found the name of the man. Do you remember that? Uh, I have it written down somewhere. S something like Puccino? Uh, yeah, Puccio. Puccio, yeah. Piero, Piero di Puccio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, this is a reproduction of the Sinopia of the Pisan frescoes, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, what you, what, this photograph was made from a picture in a book, wasn't it? That's right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you visited Pisa. I guess you've been there more than once. Well, I think I had only seen this um, this series of uh, the drawing under the fresco once, maybe maybe twice in the same trip. But yeah. Uh, I felt that that. Uh, visit was uh, uh, particularly significant in relation to modern art uh, because the paintings uh, are something like 40 feet long, yes, mm -hmm. and maybe at least 20 feet high, so that they made most modern things look sort of small. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then in the book, uh, what was intriguing here was the how did the man uh, how did this drawing even get on the wall by this I mean uh, you know there's the feeling that there is a duplicate head here and there is the feeling of the gesture of this somewhere up in here but how did he get this architecture and the, the geometry of the figure composition together is uh, what mystified me. That <coughs> Could you describe the background from where you are? Um, what do you mean by the background? This? The architecture, yes, the drawing. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Point out the, um, uh, the architecture that we've been speaking about, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the way to do is perhaps to start with the diagonals that are here, which give some sense of the so-called perspective depth. But the minute I do that and I begin to look in here for others, I do see this, which uh, at the moment seems to be related to 
uh, to the other diagonals. But I notice then the diagonals here. Uh, and I don't understand that. Uh, by that I mean here you've got the pattern of the robe, but you've got them in the diagonal of the perspective diagonal. That's the thing that seems so wonderful. And this coming across through here. So I, un I understand uh, certainly the, the relationship of this horizontal or this one to that. That's, I could see a man could draw that, but I don't understand the other, how this got there or how these, yeah. And then as I keep on looking at it, I see obviously this circle he must have drawn, he certainly did draw, and he related it to the circles here. But did he then consciously relate it to this circle? There's one here, part of one anyway. I may be too close to this to be able to see it. So there are lots of small circles, but how, the, it's how those geometric shapes relate in the most mysterious way. That is that enough? Yes. Do you, do you remember about how large this fresco is? Mm. I mean, are the figures life-size or larger than mm -hmm. life-size? Well, in the, uh, in the major paintings, I'm not sure even that I saw this, because uh, uh, the book is filled with illustrations. Uh, I said that one of the paintings is 40 feet long, and I would believe that the figures are above life-size, more than life-size. You know, I'm not sure in this one. You know, you, if you keep on looking at this, you see interrelationships that, uh, uh, you, that move away from <coughs> just the obvious diagonal or circle. Because if I begin here, uh, I've left this one now, and I begin there, then I can go this way. <coughs> now, what's the significance of these patterns in these relationships? Mm -hmm. I've heard you speak before about this in, uh, say, Baroque painting, for example, in the work of Correggio. Mm -hmm. What do you find significant? Are these something that help organize the painting, the composition, the placement of the pictures? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the mystery of this is the inventiveness of it, because this man apparently knew everything. That's what... Uh, that's what thrills me, I suppose. Uh, he would have to have known how to draw everything uh, and understand everything, because he, he has drawn the faces. Here's, a, here's a potential early one, and this is the final one. But he had to be able to draw everything in every position and invent all the folds. Uh, he didn't do this from something that he saw in the studio. So this is what uh, sort of overwhelms me, is the ability to incorporate all of that into uh, this very complicated design. I don't know what to say beyond that. Uh, the main, maybe the main thing that's important is that this is extremely fascinating without you knowing what the subject is. There's, it's almost as though the subject is quite secondary. Uh, the truth is that this is the coronation of the Virgin, but uh, what difference does that make as far as the composition goes? This is the only recognizable figure. Uh, mm -hmm. I just felt that that uh, epitomizes the, uh, uh, 
well, it's sort of an artistic organization with no subject. It's, the, uh, it's as abstract as a piece of music. Um, and uh, what has it done in the th about 1340 or something like that? Yeah. About 1380s. 1380, yeah. Well, do you want to try putting that other photograph near it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I, there was just one thing I wanted to, to add, perhaps, is that uh, I think what you're pointing out is that the artist uh, would have had to have known, first of all, a great deal about the human figure, mm -hmm. secondly, about draperies and mm -hmm. the way they fold and fall around the figure. Uh -huh. Uh, he would have had to have understood something about perspective mm -hmm. uh, and the the creation of a th the illusion of a three dimensional space through the use of orthogonals that we see in space. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he somehow comprehended the importance of having a ge geometric substructure or framework mm -hmm. around which uh, he could compose the rest of the yeah. composition. Um, I think this is evident in some of his other work, where he would, would take several figures and uh, begin first with the geometric shapes, like the circles, overlapping circles, and then he would draw the figure on top of that. Mm -hmm. And the figure, yeah. he would sometimes adjust the figure to fit into the geometric patterns. Yeah, he always did, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, I noticed uh, in, that you have, were, have been trying to incorporate this into one of your recent works now. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, you just recently saw a review of a book by Jackson Pollock, mm -hmm. or on Jackson Pollock, uh, which is behind you. I wonder if you could explain mm -hmm. it. Yeah, um, yeah, I think we'd need to clarify that I had felt. Um, maybe that uh, you said to incorporate it in one of my recent paintings. I had felt that textually it was so wonderful, and uh, it, uh, the reason I had it blown up or enlarged uh, was that I felt that the reproduction, which was quite small, was very important. And so um, I didn't say to you, but I think that I may be calling that person who's standing in front of this in the painting something like, uh, maybe I'll use something like the teacher or something, because the position of the figure is as though he is explaining something, isn't it? And so he's standing there, but I've tried to incorporate into the body of that person uh, part of the uh, geometry of this. Yeah. So I've never done this before. So I'm really just sort of honoring that photograph, which seems so marvelous to me, you know. Well, I think in a moment we can go over to the painting and uh, you can uh, show us. Well, do you want to see this, Pollock? Yeah. See, by accident again, if you want to call it that, uh, I don't feel it is, but... Um, uh, this photograph was one of several in a uh, recent issue of the Christian Science Monitor. And it's so incredibly related to uh, that photograph that I couldn't help but uh, place them together. And I think um, both of us agreed that this is much less uh, spontaneous or intuitive or unthinking than, than uh, anyone could ever say. Uh, the first thing that uh, we both have agreed upon is that uh, you cannot deny that that diagonal and this diagonal, or any one of them, uh, are not intended. And it seems to me they're as intended as they are here although this moves toward a figure, and this one tries not to. Uh, but I don't know much about Jackson Pollock, and I, didn't, I can't say I even read the article. Uh, 
But what this shows me is that that man knew uh, uh, an enormous amount and that this was not just playing around on a piece of canvas. I don't know what further to say if the person looking at this uh, would be able to devise almost anything if, they, if he wished as a subject here. <clears throat> But um, it's kind of a miracle that the two seem so much alike. Um, what did you say? Did you say it wasn't an accident or something like that? Uh, there was no conclusion? I mentioned that there was, uh, there was no conclusion. That well, I think you said earlier that um, you can see some of these relationships mm -hmm. on occasion. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you uh, looked in the room around you. Oh, you mean that I personally could, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I think that's slightly different uh, than what we're talking about. Uh, what we said was that uh, these relationships exist everywhere and are usually not seen. Isn't that what we said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that you would uh, have to be in some kind of a inner condition that allows you to see it. So what you really need to do in some way is to um, empty your mind of uh, what the, uh, the ordinary junk that it's usually filled with and, uh, and begin in some way to open to the potential that is there before you. Is that right? Yeah. I think that mystery is slightly different, though, than what I consider this one uh, or these two. But if I draw at my best, I believe that I do point out uh, that this, this particularly exists uh, everywhere. If I draw, if I draw correctly, so um, again, I guess what I'm saying is that it is not that the drawing, as in this case, points out the points out individual objects. It points out the interrelationship of everything. You would say all objects, regardless of what they are. It points out the way they tie together. And, and when, to me, you draw well, that's what you're pointing out, too. Uh, yeah. So I'm always surprised when I sit someplace and, uh, and look, or I'm able in a, to look in a certain way, that I see many things that uh, are very astonishing. Do you feel it might be the role of the artist to reveal these relationships? I think you mentioned this Sam, for example. Yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, and maybe not all all artists, but uh, certainly Cezanne. Uh, I've, I said uh, he shows you a kind of universe that exists in the most ordinary objects, and you could take one of the unfinished paintings, particularly and see that what he was doing was uh, relating <coughs> uh, everything to everything else. Uh, yeah, usually, um, yeah. <coughs> I have the feeling that when I uh, speak, I almost need a pencil or a piece of charcoal. Uh, I, I, I think visually, yes, and, uh, well, if, if you go on with this, you say that uh, if this canvas that this painting was made on, or that one, was even a small amount less tall, and therefore much more rectangular, much more uh, uh, long than, than tall, uh, all of these diagonals would have changed. No? So it's not only the size that the person is working on, but it's the exact shape of it. And then we said that if you ask anybody or six people to put one spot on 
a thing of a certain size and shape, that as they walked toward it, they would have to consciously decide where they were going to put that one spot, and it would be determined by the uh, the length and the uh, and the height of the object. So this goes on all the time. Uh, uh, that isn't very clear, but that means that the average person doesn't know anything about. Uh, it doesn't have the information available that this man had. Therefore, they can't compose in this way, but still, psychologically, they have the same attitude as they walk toward a shape to put one spot. Yeah. Well, isn't this related to the composition of murals, say, for example, in the 1930s post office mm -hmm. history, or even the Sistine ceiling? Yeah, of course. But th there again, that's right. This is uh, an architectural demand, and the mural can't work at all unless it has a relationship to the the size and shape, and something about the architectural rhythm around it. Yeah. Well, what we're doing is talking about uh, truisms. Is that right? Uh, but, uh, well, I think that you 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 did say that there's a certain kind of condition that that one has to be in to see this, and. Uh, if part of that condition requires the anemping of one's mm -hmm. stomach, which I don't think is a truism. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that ordinarily most people realize how much one can see mm -hmm. if they are open and receptive, mm -hmm. but it requires a certain type of clarity of mind. I don't know. Yeah, but, but we're talking about two things there, because the one is uh, what one sees if he looks correctly or looks openly, and the other is how he would take this data and and relate it to something which he's inventing or composing. Yeah, those those would be two different things. But um, I feel in my own in my own case that what I'm talking about being able to see, I wasn't consciously aware of when I was younger. I must have been able to, but I didn't know it. But I know with the few large paintings I did um, that they were the shapes, the placement of the shapes was always determined by the architecture. But it was only, um, yeah, only maybe in the last 20 years even that I began to be aware that uh, there was an underlying geometry that joined everything that one, everything that one sees. Um, and then you would have to be in a condition to receive it. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, could you discuss this photograph? Uh, you yeah, well, yeah, uh, well, this was a long time ago. Uh, and at that time, uh, for some reason or other, something that was going on in me uh, made me convinced that uh, in many circumstances, especially in relation to the outdoors, uh, that I saw a, a, um, a spiral shape, something which uh, grew larger but came from a center. And most, in most cases, they interwove. This was uh, possibly an accident that three photographs were put on the floor somewhere. And they all, this is, this, the, the, the entire photograph here was made uh, from the accidental placement of these uh, three photographs. Now, you can call it an accident. That's the thing that interests me is that I feel as though the spiral shape here, uh, there's one here and one there. Uh, it's so obviously related to that, but I can't believe that it's exactly the same as this. Now, that was not uh, placed there together intentionally. So, <clears throat> and we've seen that the movement of the sort of textual direction is similar in this photograph to this one. 
and in the objects too. Anything else? Uh, I think this is astonishing, this one. Yes, could you point out the, um, the relationship, say, between in, in the grid of lines inside the eye with the mm -hmm. pattern of the leaves and branches Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, can you see that from where you are? Uh, yes. these, these sort of lines here, this we could understand as part of the same organ organism, this eye. I don't understand why this little diagonal should radiate within the pupil and go out to sort of join into the hair. I can't explain that. Uh, but then what about when it goes over and goes into this photograph? and has the same feeling of, uh, of really texture, the small shapes. Uh, I suppose I say that this goes over here, and the, rhythmically the, the movement is the same. If I do that with my hand, that's the movement of this shape, and it's also the movement of this shape. Probably many others. So, Here. Mm -hmm. We noticed this before. I'm sure this was intentional, because this is in the single Chinese drawing. This is intentional. But uh, how did this happen? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can you see that from where you are? Is it shining? And mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. So it fills a whole frame. Yeah. And you saw that where the, did you accidentally put the three photographs together on the floor? I, th I I accidentally put them. I certainly was collecting material in this direction, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> Didn't you write at one time that uh, you felt that there must be? Sort of inner condition that is necessary before one can see these things. Well, I know this is true. Yeah, in, in teaching, particularly that. Uh, but uh, in myself, uh, we all know that if we go down the street with the mind filled with a lot of uh, problems of various kinds, that uh, you you often don't see anything. So if you sit before something and wish to see it then you have in some way to be empty in order to receive it. That's, um, even now I'm looking across the street and I, uh, 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 when I sort of am quieter, I can see a great deal right there or anywhere in the room. So. But, uh, <coughs> yeah, I think it is fascinating that the things that, that, that an artist can very deliberately and consciously work out in a mural painting as a composition mm -hmm. can have a relationship to something that looks so accidental as, as, as dripping paint on canvas and something like a photograph of a forest and an eye and a print. I think there is a certain... Yeah. Uh Oh, the man, Ma Minor White, who taught uh, photography at MIT, I believe, um, said to some young person that uh, they could learn everything there was to know about a camera in six weeks, and that the quality of the photograph depend upon the uh, inner, inner state. So this is related, I think. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you suppose that this may be related to music in some way? I'd, no question about it, yeah. I would say absolutely. Yeah. And it is good to say that uh, you couldn't possibly invent on a piano or a violin unless you had the basic uh, material in you. You had studied for a comparatively long time. Uh, what did they say, like maybe four or six years for a talented person? Uh, then they could begin to invent. But you and I couldn't do one single thing 
No, I couldn't possibly do anything in that direction. No. I can move my hands in a rhythm, and I feel that's probably the connection between uh, both music, dancing, and painting, is that you do have a sense of the rhythm. Uh, but I can't invent uh, musically. And I can't, my job is to incorporate whatever degree of subject I have with the rhythm of the painting. Uh, that I've said before, if I do this, this gesture, I don't feel one here, but maybe, uh, maybe that would be. But I don't feel any violence here or there. And if I do that, that's a violent gesture in the same direction, isn't it? And if I get to the same place by doing that, then the, then the melody has changed. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, I, I think that um, perhaps even the music of that period, the, the late Gothic or early Renaissance period, may have some relationship to that mural. I would be sure. Yeah. I'd be sure of that, yeah. And the contemporary jazz music of the 20th century, mid-20th century, mm -hmm. would be related to the Pollock. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know enough about music. But I would be sure that music is always related to to the concepts of the time. And, you know, I don't know whether this would relate to jazz or not, but uh, I don't see how it could relate so well to that uh, and still relate to modern jazz, because I think what we're trying to indicate is that there's something much more classically connected with this uh, than we had ever thought much more traditionally connected. Uh, all he's done here is to leave out the subject. Uh, but rhythm, rhythmically, it's, uh, it seems almost identical to this. Mm. Yeah, I think the other thing that we said was that he could not have done this unless he had uh, some kind of great understanding of maybe of the tradition, but certainly of natural form. So it's not an unknowing uh, 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 spontaneity. It's a knowing spontaneity. Yeah. Well, now, on the back of that paper, there's another picture by Paul. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this one. Uh, can you see it from there? Yeah, this one indicates uh, uh, the same kind of traditional knowledge. And both of us felt that there was a progression. Now, whether you're moving this way uh, as in a procession, uh, it seemed to me that this is very related to, um, I said, a Hittite mural where men are leading bullocks, or could it be an Indian carving, a bas-relief? in which there's a complicated interweaving of, uh, of shape. But it certainly has the feeling of a progression. This is much more figurative than the, uh, than the other one, isn't it? Can you get that? Yes. Well, it certainly shows that Pollock was a very well-trained artist, very knowledgeable of what's. That's th that's what I would feel, yeah. Of the inter, of the, well, anyway, there's, the painting reveals it. Is, yeah. All he did was to leave out the subject. Not, uh, I'll put that here too. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah. Well, is that enough? Yes, I just wanted to finish this with uh, some two or three questions. Um, you've often spoken of wishing to send someone, a student, over. That's right. Yeah. To Italy or Europe. Yeah. To, to sh for them to see these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've taken steps to, to set up a, mm -hmm. uh, an educational foundation. Mm -hmm. that would provide for a scholarship for students 
to go over there. Um, could you tell us what your wishes are, are in regard to this? Um, yeah. The scholarship. Yeah. The well, I think that I felt when I had uh, seen this last uh, that uh, it set an unbelievably high standard and that if some of the young ones could go to Pisa and see the Sinopia, it would, it would raise their standard. It would practically put it beyond their ability. But the main point is that one can often go through uh, a town like Pisa and not see this at all, meaning that you go see the Leaning Tower and a couple of other things that all the sightseers go to, but uh, here is this marvelous collection of uh, objects which almost no, one, uh, almost no one goes into the room where they are. And uh, I thought that it was worth a trip around the world to see this, uh, to, to establish a kind of standard for uh, one's own judgment. That would be the reason, yeah. yeah. You wouldn't say it was great because it was big. You would say it was great because it had this kind of quality, you see. Yeah. All right. How, how, how long do you think it would take a student to realize, to see this, uh, to see what's in a work like this? Well, see, uh, there again we might relate it to what you're doing because you're doing what's te called teaching art history and uh, uh, for young people who have uh, some wish, uh, you are trying to lead them in this direction. Uh, I guess uh, what we're both saying is that uh, underlying all the great things is almost the same thing. Because I know the minute I start thinking, I realize that this is uh, marvelous in terms of the uh, cave paintings. And you practically don't know the date of the cave paintings. But some human being has I incorporated the texture of the wall and uh, objects, yes, but always with the same quality or the same interest in the quality of the line and the integration of the, uh, of the shapes. So you must have something which is uh, at the foundation of greatness. Yeah. Now, since you helped establish the art department mm -hmm. at the American University, would you want the scholarship to go to a student uh, from American University? Or could it be students from other? Well, I think that, that the way this is expressed is uh, particularly of the American University, but I think it is indicated that it would be open. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Would you want the student to be able to travel there just for the summer or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I don't see the reason for studying there. I would just think to go there and see it. Uh, if you were in Pisa for three days and you saw this and spent two afternoons, you'd have something established within you that would remain there. Uh, the same way it affects me. There's well, haven't you been concerned for some time about the transmission of values and standards? Oh, that, yeah, that's absolute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. I think that's too big a subject to go on with further now, Kitty. <laughs> yeah. I suppose what I was referring to is um, the, this, this article uh, on Kirsting. Mm -hmm. It was actually an interview, and um, he referred to the situation in New York City, um, where you have. Uh, the current generation of faculty who don't seem to be transmitting mm -hmm. anything to their students, and that the students are coming out of school 
uh, without standards and mm -hmm. without a real knowledge of anything from the past, a real understanding of the art of the past, yeah. whether in music mm -hmm. or in painting. Um, and um, this uh, situation appears reflected in the uh, current art world uh, in which there seems to be a lowering of standards across the board. Mm -hmm. And um, one sees it in faculty exhibitions and mm -hmm. student exhibitions. And, and with this discussion that we just had about the paintings, um, I think there's a very clear um, analysis of how uh, similar values can be found in both figurative as well as mm -hmm. completely abstract art and that a well-trained eye or individual is able to analyze work of art mm -hmm. in terms of these relationships uh, and derive real pleasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas in the much of contemporary work, I think mm -hmm. one is, is hard put to find the similar standards or, or pleasure. Um, and it's partly, I think, because of the the very poor quality of the work, much of which mm -hmm. uh, is um, more highly regarded in some respect than the art of the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't understand that. You see, I think you've just given us a very clear analysis of, of a very traditional, or a, 14th century fresco mm -hmm. and a very contemporary work mm -hmm. of art by Jackson Pollock. Uh, and you have been able to demonstrate that mm -hmm. there are similar things in both works. Yeah, well, that would be fundamental, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, well, the reason that we started collecting material from other people like Kirstein, uh, was that uh, I, for instance, don't feel myself sufficiently au courant with a great deal that's going on, but uh, the, the, uh, the contemporary architecture bothers me greatly uh, for almost the same reasons. That I, just, I just cannot accept this uh, departure from what you call the quality of something that was uh, uh, to which people you uh, previously responded and still do. So I had to find some uh, authorities in in fields uh, to speak about this, in like uh, Nadia Boulanger in relation to music and so forth. Uh, yeah. Um, I know. Well, th th yeah, this morning, too, I was sort of looking for a sentence which uh, might be suitable here. Um, in previous times, uh, a young person, say a child, uh, you could take a Mozart or some dancer or actress, was brought up by parents who knew something about uh, suppose you said an art form, and the child grew up uh, accepting this as a natural way to express himself, so that he did not have the problem that many young people face today when they have finished high school, which is our uh, general education. He has had a taste of a lot of things, and at the age of 18, he's faced with uh, uh, usually the idea that he has to now go earn a living or learn something to make a living from. But he doesn't, uh, he's not often basing his choice upon what has meaning to him or what will give meaning to his life. The society seems in our time to be uh, uh, in directing the young person toward either attainment or money. 
So he has not the training from early youth, and he has at the age of 18 <coughs> to make the decision as to whether, he, as to how he's going to uh, continue his life. And it's a very difficult thing. Uh, yeah, I don't, if you hadn't had training before 18 in singing, what would happen? I'm not sure. But the dancers have to start at about 11, don't they? Uh, to train. But in painting, uh, uh, you may have that inclination, and when you get to be 18, what are you going to do? Uh, if you go to college, you have to be terribly careful that you go where the instruction in painting is, is uh, of a high standard. Uh, I don't know, this material that we've been collecting has been trying to uh, work out that problem. What is the young person going to choose, and what sort of life will they face if they do? Uh, no, I cannot give a uh, summary sentence on this. I think in the paper that we wrote, the summary sentence was that if this is what you are, I believe this is true, that uh, if you really are that, you are a musician, or you are a painter, then there it really is no matter of choice. This is what you do. Uh, many of the people that I know, and it, it, so of myself, I don't remember ever making a choice. I just went from one thing to another. This is what I was, and I tried uh, to express it. Uh, yeah? But, uh, mm, that's enough. Thank you, very eloquently expressed. <laughs> Speriamo. <laughs>
Living in exile, many Mayans have learned how to organize and they have begun to speak. A young Quiche woman living in Paris described the terrible violence she experienced in her autobiography, I, Rigoberto Menchu. Following its publication, she emerged as one of the leading figures in the international movement for indigenous people's rights and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992. She is regularly attacked by the military and government-controlled media as a left-wing militant because of her demands for sweeping social reform and a quick end to military domination. In the spring of 1993, she hosted the first summit of indigenous peoples in Guatemala. On the opening day, her speech called on delegates to persevere in their struggle for human rights. On the second day of the conference, there was another military coup in Guatemala and all constitutional guarantees, including the right to assemble, were suspended. Across the border in Chiapas, Mexico, the Maya are also struggling for economic and social equality. Early in 1994, a poorly armed group calling themselves Zapatistas seized control of several towns in their declaration of war on the Mexican government, they cite the long history of oppression of the indigenous peoples and call for all people to join in their struggle for work, land, health, education, democracy, and peace. The Maya are a remarkable people who have managed not only to survive 500 years of injustice, but to have survived with hope for the future. They believe that the fifth cycle of creation, beginning in the year 2012, will be a new dawn, a time of cultural renaissance for the Maya, when their ancient wisdom will be rediscovered by the world. Thank you.